So hello everybody, thank you for taking the time to join today's webinar, which is regards to a flow cytometry method for the detection of bacteria in water. Uh, so my name is Stephanie Ting, and I'm currently the field application scientist for Southeast Asia, India, Hong Kong, Macau, and Australia and New Zealand, currently based in Singapore for Asia Biosciences. So if you, you all are currently on mute, but if you do have any questions, we will be taking questions at the end of the webinar and you can type them either in the chat or in the question or answer. So to start off, why exactly are we interested in testing water and what are the current methods? Well, essentially bacteria are inherently present in drinking water systems and different treatment processes can affect the concentrations of indigenous bacteria in water profoundly. Now the acceptable bacterial level in a water sample depends on the treatment process and the local water quality standards. So an accurate and sensitive monitoring of bacteria is not only important to assure safety and quality of the final product, but also to monitor, control, and optimize specific treatment processes. Now, while the title states that we are detecting bacteria in water, this same flow cytometric process can actually be used in other industries, such as bioprocesses for beer and wine, or quality control in dairy, in dairy or high density fed uh, batch fermentation. Now, the most common method in which they actually detect bacteria right now is the heterotrophic plate counts. So there are a variety of simple culture-based tests that are intended to recover a wide range of microorganisms from water that are re collectively referred to as heterotrophic plate counts or HPC procedures. So the problem is that there actually is no universal HPC measurement. So although standardized methods have been formalized, HPC test methods involve a wide variety of test conditions that lead to a wide range of quantitative and qualitative results. Now, as you can see here in the diagram, essentially for this method, bacteria is serial diluted and then plated onto agar and allowed to grow over a certain period of time to form colonies. Then afterwards, visually, the user will then count the number of colonies, and depending on how much they count and what the actual dilution is, you will multiply these factors together in order to determine the number of bacteria per milliliter within your sample. Now, the temperatures that are employed for these processes can actually range from around 20 degrees Celsius to 30, 40 degrees Celsius, and the incubation times can range from a few hours to seven days or even a few weeks and the nutrient conditions from low to high. So clearly there is no specific method in which this is done, and it will always be different depending on what type of sample you are arranging and what bacteria you're detecting. Now, another problem is that only a small portion of the metabolically active microorganisms present in water samples can grow and be detected under a given set of HPC test conditions. And the population you recovered will actually be significantly different according to the methods used. Now, the actual organisms recovered in the HPC testing can also uh, vary widely between locations, between seasons, and even between consecutive, consecutive samples at a simple location. So usually it takes approximately three days to detect the microbiological contamination of drinking water. And in addition, the detection of other pathogens such as Legionella can easily take several days or weeks. So essentially, there is a large need in order to find a rapid and high throughput microbiological technique in order to determine the number of bacteria within your water. Now, EWIG, which is part of the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology. Now, this group is actually dedicated to three key areas of research, and that's water for human welfare, water for ecosystem function, strategies for making trade-offs, and resolving competing demands. Now, specifically within the research group, Professor Thomas Egley, in collaboration with Dr. Frederick Hams, are actually promoting the use of flow cytometry in order to do the microbiological quality of water resources and drinking water. Now, while flow cytometry was originally used in medical routine analysis, it is now finding its way into the quality control uh, for drinking water and is a promising alternative to existing methods. Now, the measurement principle of flow cytometry is really quite simple. So prior to the actual measurement, the bacteria in the water sample are stained with a fluorescent dye. This water sample is then forced through a glass capillary, and the number of cells are detected by a laser beam. 
So with this flow psychometric technique, the determination of the total number of suspended bacteria is complete within 15 minutes. Now besides the total cell number, the size of the cells can be determined as well. And with this information, a microbiological fingerprint of each water sample can be generated, which allows rapid detection of changes or failures during drinking water treatment and distribution. With the specific use of dyes or antibodies, living intact cells can be distinguished from dead cells. Furthermore, specific pathogenic organisms can be deactivated as well. Now, essentially, we, I did speak to Dr. Vivek, um, who is currently based in Mumbai, and he actually suggested. So while most of the regulatory systems are still based on HPC methods, you can use flow cytometry as a first level defense. So you can do rapid uh, treatments or rapid analysis of all of your samples. And after you do that, you can actually know the specific concentration that you would then need to plate your bacteria onto the agar plates, as opposed to plating 10 to 20 plates and actually guessing that. So it is a great way to use in conjunction with HPC as the first level defense. Now, in addition to EWAG, there are also, pardon me, in addition to EWAG, there are several other groups and publications that are trying to promote the use of flow cytometry um, for the use of testing of water. So clearly there's a high demand of a new way to actually test it. Now, in addition to HPC, there are also other methods. So for instance, this is a chart that summarizes basic differences between these methods. So for one, there is spectral fault photometry, which is traditional detection method. So it's a very fast web method that requires only seconds per sample. However, there are high detection limits and indirect counts restrict this application. Now, in addition to this, Imaging is also one of the oldest detection methods and can be used for direct visualization of bacterial cells, rocks, and biofilms in a 2D or 3D configuration. Now, one of the main limitations of microscopy is the relatively wide variation for the detection of target cells. In addition, imaging methods are generally time-consuming and quite labor-intensive. Now, the next one is a faster DNA-based quantification method, such as quantitative PCR, which measures the accumulation of amplicons during a PCR reaction in real time by fluorescence. A fluorescence readout is obtained, for example, uh, by using an intercalculating dye or fluorescent probe, and is correlated to the amount of product formed in real time during the log phase or PCR amplification. However, bearing in mind the bias involved in PCR-based methods, caution should actually be exercised when claiming the sequencing results as they can reflect the whole microbial diversity in and whether or not they can actually reflect the whole microbial diversity in natural ecosystems. So one drawback of applying DNA-based molecular techniques is to study the activity of microbial communities is that it is difficult to study the physiological properties of microorganisms based on their phylogenetic relationship with others. So if you compare all of these above methods with flow cytometry, flow cytometry itself does stand out, as you can see from the graph or from the table, for its accuracy, speed, and the, even the option to sort components of interest. Nevertheless, the potential of flow cytometry for microbiology is far from being fully utilized. Therefore, each method has its very advantage and limit, uh, various advantages and limitations. So definitely a combination of all of these would actually allow a full solution. Now the same group, also propose these several different benefits of using flow cytometry for water testing. For instance, you have much more relevant information. You can do very rapid analysis. The measurements themselves are known to be quite reproducible with a single operator or instrument variability that is less than 3%. Whereas if you have different people who are doing, for instance, HBD tests, there are quite a, lar a large amount of variability in between. FCM can also be quite low cost. There is potential for automation uh, you can do FCM fingerprinting, multivariable data, if you use several different fluorescent colors in combination with intensity and light scattering for each particle. And in addition, you can also do flexible staining. So of course, those who are not familiar with flow cytometry, this is the basic principle of how it works. So essentially, there's a beam of light, which is usually a laser, that's passed through a stream of microorganisms 
stored in single file through capillary. So that's essentially the light source right here and the particles that will then go through its interrogation point and then be excited by the laser that is coming around that point. So when the light beam strikes the cell, part of the radiation is scattered and redirected by lenses, mirrors, and filter system, and then picked up by a light detector. So thanks to electronic signal detection, up to 1,000 particles per second can actually be counted with the required sample volume generally being less than a milliliter. In addition, the cells can be stained with fluorescent dyes, and these bind to certain cell components, such as DNA, protein, or cell surface structures, making it possible, for example, to distinguish living from dead or inactive cells. So these two plots below are some example data that you can actually acquire from flow cytometry. So the first is a histogram. So if you're only looking at one parameter, so FSE is known as force scatter. So this is a measure of size. So you can have two different populations and with the differences in size, you can actually gate out your population of interest. In addition to that, if you do have some type of fluorescent label, so for instance, for DNA maybe, you can plot that label on one of the axes against the size. And again, using that, you can actually find your population of interest and then do counts in terms of how many are within there. So the basic protocol for bacterial analysis um, using a flow cytometer, first is potentially pre-treatment of a sample. So you can potentially just use the water sample as is, or if you're using something, for instance, as milk, you would need to do a pretreatment in order to remove the fat and lipids and proteins within the sample before you actually stain it. The second step then is to actually stain the cells or the bacteria within the sample with a fluorescent dye. For instance, a dye that will stain the nucleic acid, certain proteins, pump stains, or membrane stains. And then after that, you would run it through the flow cytometer. So this example that you can see in the diagram right here, the one on the left is stained with cyber green. So this is a DNA specific dye that is actually membrane permeable. This means that even if the cells are living or dead, this dye will stain all of them. So it would have a total enumeration of all the bacteria within your sample. You can also do double staining where you stain with cyber green and in addition to that, you would then stain it with propidium iodide, otherwise known as PI. Now, PI, on the other hand, is membrane impermeable, meaning it will only stain the DNA of cells that, have, that are actually dead or have uh, the membrane actually being broken up. So that means that if the cell is only positive for cyber green, that means it is healthy and living. Otherwise, if it's double stained for both PI and cyber green, this is bacteria that is actually dead. So of course, there are several other dyes that are available if you want to use these to stain your bacteria. And depending on the setup of your flow cytometer, you would then choose the correct dye. So you always need to ensure that one, you have the correct laser that would excite your dye. So I have them labeled here on the, on the table. So for instance, strat requires a red laser. Cytal, Cyber Green, PI, and 7AAD require a blue laser. Zappi requires a violet laser, and a HRSA requires a UV laser. So the second point is that you also need to ensure that you have certain filters that can actually collect the emission. And if you look onto the data sheet with regards to each one of these dyes, that will let you know specifically at which wavelength these dyes will optimally emit at. And then the final point that you would also need to look at is the permeability. So if the DNA dye is membrane permeable, just that dye on its own will stain both living and dead cells. Whereas specifically dyes such as PI and 7AAD, these are membrane impermeable. So these will only stain cells that are dead unless you actually permeabilize the cell beforehand. And the final point is that some dyes such as cyto, DAPI and PI will stain both the DNA and RNA. So depending on what type of experiment you're doing, you might also need to treat it with RNAsey in order to get rid of the RNA to ensure that only the DNA is stained. So some typical features of flow cytometric data is plotted right here. So you have your fluorescence parameter, 
And so in this specific situation, we're probably dealing with a DNA, dealing with a DNA die. So if you're moving along the axis as you move to the right, you have an increase in the intensity, so an increase in the total amount of DNA within your sample. Over on the y-axis, we have a satellite parameter. So there are two parameters, additional parameters in addition to fluorescence. So the first I've already discussed, and that is Ford scatter, so that's a measurement of size. So there's also one called side scatter, so SSC, and this is a measurement of the granularity of your sample. So if you plot that on the y-axis, typically on the bottom left-hand corner, this is instrument noise or residual stain. You'll have background or abiotic particles up around here. And then finally, ones that have less scattered light, but have an actual fluorescence intensity with increasing amounts, then this is your actual bacterial samples. So if you can see two separate populations, this can actually be different bacterial clusters, which is distinguished by the difference in scattering fluorescence. You can also use synthetic B standards um, in order to determine the size of your bacteria, and those can be run together within your sample. And after that, you would simply draw a gate around where your bacteria is, and then from that, you can calculate the actual count of your bacteria within your sample. So as a first example, this is actually an application note directly from ACIA using the Novocyte flow cytometer. And this is a detection of bacteria in natural waters and several different types of waters. So as you can see, similar to the previous plot I showed you, these samples were stained with fiber green. So again, the fiber green will stain both living and dead bacteria within your sample. So the fiber green is plotted on the x-axis and the red channel is, is plotted on the y-axis just to allow a greater distribution of your sample, but there is no double staining within the sample. So as mentioned here, as mentioned in the previous slide, this bottom left-hand corner over here is considered noise or non-bacterial particles. Over here is the inorganic particles. And finally, here is your actual bacterial sample. So typically, this fact can actually split into low nucleic acid bacteria and high nucleic acid bacteria. So it's broadly accepted that high nucleic, active, uh, high nucleic active bacteria is active bacteria, whereas LNA is inactive, dead, or dormant population. So whether LNA and HNA are different types of bacteria or physiologically different states is still unclear. Um, but just by looking at this plot right here, you can see clearly that there is a slight difference in the population. So, of course, high nucleic acid bacteria will have a higher uh, DNA content. So, specifically, if you are using a novocyte, we do have a syringe pump that is actually taking up your samples. And because of that, we know the exact volume that is actually required. And through that, we can do direct absolute count without the use of reference beads. So, one, this will save you time. But in addition to that, you're also saving money because you don't actually have to buy those beads. So then different types of water were run through the novocyte, and using the same gate, they had several different counts. So for instance, deionized water, you had less than one bacterial cell per microliter, up to wet end water, where you had 9,200 cells per microliter. So if you see this data actually plotted out, you can see that with the various water sources, such as the distilled water, bottled water, tap water, mountain water, spring, lake, uh, Malajiabu water and wetland water, you have differences in terms of the absolute count of the bacteria. And of course, if you apply the same gates, you can immediately see all the statistics within the software showing that the absolute count ranges from 0.4 to 9,200. So in order to also test the accuracy of our syringe pump, they actually did multiple dilutions of the same water sample from 1 to 10 to 1 to 80 and 1 to 1,280, and found the absolute count within the gates for all of those samples. And if you plotted the theoretical values of the cells per microliter to the total absolute counts that we had from the novocyte, you can clearly see that there is a large linearity within the varying dilutions, showing how accurate our syringe pump is using the novocyte. So as I would mentioned earlier, you can also do double staining in order to get further data. So in this specific example, the cells were stained with cyber green in order to stain the total cell population 
but it's also stained with PI. And again, <clears throat> PI will only stain the damaged or dead cells. So if you have cybergreen, so that was detected on the FITC channel, plotted on the x-axis, and the PI, which is detected on the PERCY P channel, on the y-axis, you can then get out the low nucleic acid, high nucleic acid, and the damaged cells over here. Now, this same sample was then treated with increasing concentrations of chlorine from zero micrograms per milliliter up to 520. And you can clearly see that there is a larger population of damaged cells and a decrease specifically in the high nucleic acid population right here, <clears throat> showing that the actual chlorine was much more effective at killing the high nucleic acid population. So you can see with this plot at the bottom, with different concentrations of chlorine from zero up to 520 micrograms per liter, and the percentage of cells for low nucleic acid decreases with the increasing concentration of chlorine, whereas the high nucleic acid, which is this blue line right here, has a much higher difference in the decrease in the percentage of viable cells, whereas the total percentage of damaged cells increases as you increase the available chlorine concentration. So I'm just going to move on to the same data example and show you how you can actually use the Novo Express software that actually comes with the Novo site in order to analyze this data. So first off, basically when you're running your data samples, you always need to have controls. So since we have a single stain sample right here, our first sample is just uh, clean water. So we always start off with a Ford scatter versus side scatter plot. So again, forward scatter is a measurement of size, and side scatter is a measurement of the granularity. So you can zoom in to your area of interest, either using auto range or actually using the magnifying tool. And as you can see right here, there's a size. However, okay, so if we go in a bit closer right here, you can see that the forward scatter value is approximately, let's say up to 400. Whereas if we go into a wetland example, you can see that there's a strong population here, but it's quite difficult to actually tell which portion of this population is background noise and which population is actually really your bacterial sample. So this is where you take into account what we call fluorescent triggering. So most of the time we set a threshold uh, with regards to forward scatter, so the size of the cell. Whereas in the case of bacteria, sometimes the size of the bacteria can be approximately the same as actual background noise. So you cannot threshold using forward scatter. So in this specific situation, we would then plot the fluorescent channel. So we do fit C and let's say versus PE. So again, our cyber green, the samples were staying with cyber green and we're detecting it on the fit C channel. So specifically here, we can see that this is clearly the bacterial population. So you can then set the threshold with regards to the FITC channel. So if we go back to our very clean water sample and simply plot FITC versus, for instance, side scatter. So if we zoom in to the sample, just the natural autofluorescence of the background particles maybe goes up to 10 to the third or so. Okay. So we can actually threshold out this entire population. So they ran these samples at a fluorescent threshold of 500. Within the actual software, you can actually click adjust on plot and actually manually move this. So for instance, if we already know that this is background, you could actually potentially increase the threshold to approximately this point. And once you have that selected, it automatically changes this uh, within the thresholded settings. So all of these samples were run with a fluorescent triggering of 500. And if you plot the forward scatter versus side scatter, and for instance, this is with the distilled water, you can then gate out the population of interest. So probably an easier one to find this gate is if we go down to wetland. And if we zoom into the population, we can then draw a gate around this population that we consider the bacteria. So again, this is background. Here are abiotic particles, and this should be your population of interest. So as I mentioned, with the Novocyte, we can do direct absolute count without the use of reference feeds. 
So if we click on this black triangle, we can then see the statistics, right click, choose absolute count. And then you can see within this red P1 gate, there is 9,282 bacteria per microliter. So if you also want to see where this population is with regards to forward scatter and side scatter, you can actually do what we call backgating. So if I change this plot type to a dot plot, you can then see that the red population here correlates to whatever is found within this red gate, which we have deemed as bacteria cells. So you can clearly see that actually the size of the bacteria overlaps with the background, which is why we need to do fluorescent triggering. Now we can always um, drag and drop this to the other samples in order to paste the analysis that we've done. So if you drag and drop that and you say paste to all, this will then be copied over. But I've already done that earlier. So if you just look at the other samples, then within those gates, you can then see the differences in the populations. So that's the basic type of analysis that you can do using Novo Express. Okay, so to move on. So there are other types of analysis that you can actually do for uh, microbial analysis using a flow cytometer. So in this specific example, they actually wanted to see what happens with the incubation of groundwater in PET bottles over time. So they actually put ground, groundwater into a PET bottle or a PET bottle and left it for 21 days at 25 uh, degrees Celsius. So they then stained this with fiber green. So again, that's staining the entire population. So at day zero, you can see with fiber green on the x-axis and another fluorescent channel on the y-axis, you can see low nucleic acid and high nucleic acid populations. Whereas here, after sitting in the pet ball just for 21 days at 25 degrees Celsius, you can clearly see that there is growth in the bacteria, but also different clusters of groups, showing that there are different microbial communities that are actually being found and grown within this pet bottle. So another point of interest that may be for some researchers is actually differentiating between gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. So here's a basic summary of what are the differences, but essentially gram-positive bacteria have a greater volume of peptidyl in their cell membranes. So in other words, gram-positive bacteria have a very thick other covering. So some examples of this are streptococcus, staph bacteria, or clostridium. But however, on the other hand, because of their thin but difficult to pen penetrate cell membrane, gram-negative bacteria are often resistant to antibiotics and other antibacterial interventions. And some examples of gram-negative bacteria include cholera, gonorrhea, and E. coli. So these gram-negative bacteria has a much higher resistance to antibiotics. So it is of interest to actually differentiate which type of bacteria is within your sample. So as I mentioned earlier, we were talking about water testing, but this can be applied to other industries. So in this specific example, we used, um, the researchers used milk samples. And of course, since there are proteins and lipids found within milk, there needs to be pretreatment. Uh, to actually remove the milk within the sample. So this can be done with, for instance, Sauvignage or Proteinase AK, and then rinsed out and centrifuged and washed. So after the samples have been pretreated to remove the proteins and lipids, you can then use wheat germ agglutinin, which is otherwise known as WGA, to, in order to actually bind to the, specifically the gram-positive bacteria. So this is fluorescently labeled with APC, and the researchers did a double staining with acridine orange. And acridine orange specifically binds to nucleic acid, and this was tagged with FITC. So here you can see on the x-axis, we have a measurement of the wheat of the WGA, which, is which was tagged with APC. And on the y-axis, we have the acridine orange, so that is tagging for the DNA. So of course, we always have the background positives on the bottom of hand corner. These are specifically artifacts, probably with some residual proteins or lipids that were found within the sample. And here you can actually see the differences in population between the gram-negative bacteria, which has negative staining for WGA, and the gram-positive bacteria, which has a positive stain for WGA. So this is a very simple way in which you can actually tag and determine the differences in terms of gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria within the sample.
So there are also antibodies that can be specific to a specific type of bacteria. So there are antibodies for E. coli. Um, in this type, in this example, they use E. coli 0157H7. But there also are antibodies, for instance, for salmonella. So depending on the type of bacteria that you're interested, uh, you can always research and see whether or not their antibodies are specific to that, to that bacteria. So in this example, apple juice was spiked with E. coli. It was then stained with FITC conjugated anti-E. coli 0157 as a direct fluorescent antibody, and also double stained with C and E, uh, sorry, CTC. And CTC itself actually has a measurement and lets you know whether or not the bacteria itself is respiring. So this was ran through a flow cytometer, and on the x-axis, we have anti-E. coli, and the y-axis, we have a measurement of CTC. So you can clearly see there are two populations that are positive for E. coli, and the one that has a higher fluorescent stain for CTC is respiring E. coli, and the one that's actually lower is inactive E. coli within the sample. So some basic experimental tips. So within the application note uh, for application number 12 that we talked about earlier, there's some tips on how you can actually run bacterial samples using a NOVA site. So one is instrument setup for determining light scattering of bacteria and back, uh, background noise. And it's always very important to clean your instrument as best as possible. So for instance, use clean filtered DI water to dilute the novel flow sheet fluid and also run cleaning and rinse cycles. Now the importance of this is that a lot of times bacteria can be quite sticky. So if you are using the flow cytometer to do other types of experiments, you do want to do extensive rinsing cycles after your experimentation in order to prevent any residual uh, bacteria from staying inside of your instrument. In addition to that, if you do notice that there is some carryover, you can always run DI water in between your bacteria sample in order to do further cleaning. Now within the Novocyte, there is an automatic rinse, but sometimes, as I mentioned, the bacteria can be quite sticky. So having an extra sample in between in order to further clean this could be helpful. It's always good practice to do a routine QC test at the beginning of every day that you are using a flow cytometer to actually evaluate the instrument performance. Always have a test blank sample. So for instance, 0.1 micrometer filter deionized water to determine the lowest threshold setting for your forward scatter and also to determine the background noise on the forward scatter versus side scatter and on any applicable fluorescence detecting channels. Um, identify the proper thresholds, either with the scatter or fluorescence detection channels. And of course, run a blank sample to verify the correct set, uh, settings by observing a substantial decrease in the events collected. And of course, you can run the thresholds from above, then to run small particle samples. And as I had discussed earlier when we were doing the live data analysis, there are some small particles that are quite difficult to detect using forward scatter and side scatter. And in this case, it is best to use a fluorescent label to identify the small particle of interest and then use fluorescence triggering. So again, always have proper controls. So it's always best to run either very clean water or if you're resuspending your sample inside of a buffer, use a buffer only and run that in order to determine what type of background noise you have. If you are using a fluorescent stain, always have an unstained sample to use as a reference. And if you're doing double staining or multicolor staining, then have a single stain in order, single stain controls in order to do compensation. Now, as we had mentioned on the previous slide, always start with a very low threshold. So for instance, 100, and then first run your sample, see how the plot is, and then you can readjust the threshold as I showed earlier, you can always click adjust on plot. So you run your sample, plot it, for instance, for FITC versus Percy P, and then click adjust on plot, and you can then adjust the threshold to a more specific area if you want to get rid of more background noise. So again, if you are going to be using fluorescent triggering, which we're thresholding off the, the fluorescence, uh, you would use it specifically if you notice that the bacteria size overlaps with background particles. So as a basic protocol on how to do this, 
you would then first choose on the drop down menu the specific channel of interest that you want to threshold off of. You would then run your sample. Of course, set this value to a low value. You would run your sample and then plot it with a fluorescence channel versus another fluorescence channel. You can also plot it against fourth scatter or side scatter. That's up to you. Whatever gives you the best spread of your sample. And then you can use the adjust on plot value to actually adjust the threshold value on the plot itself. And then finally, when you have optimized the threshold settings, you can then run all of your samples according to that. So as some additional tips, so for instance, if you are using acetobacter species types of bacteria, or basically if you have any bacteria that has quite thick walls and you want the dye to actually permeabilize it, uh, you can add such things as benzoconinum chloride, polymycin B, EDT, or tween 20 to improve um, the permeabilization of the wall to allow the detection of the bacteria. Now, if you are using dyes such as the PI dye, please note that these dyes are actually quite sticky. So a wash step in between samples may be required. So finally, as a basic summary, why should we use flow cytometry for water testing? You have very rapid analysis, you have flexible staining, you can do multivariable data, automation is possible with, for instance, a robotic arm to put your plates in. They have very accurate and reproducible measurement, and you have very relevant information that can be acquired here. And you are not limited to the type of bacteria. As you mentioned, because we're using this, because we're using stain, any type of bacteria can actually be detected using flow cytometry. Whereas if you, if you are using the HPC method, there's only less than 1% of the actual bacteria that can actually be detected within those systems. So as I mentioned earlier, we did focus on water testing, but this concept can also be applied to several other areas, such as the beer and wine production, so if you want to see the viability of the yeast within your beer, or the quality control on dairy processes and high density fed batch fermentation. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, if you have any further questions, I can take them right now. Otherwise, you can also email me at sting at acbio.com. Additionally, if you would like a free 30-day trial of our Novo Express software, so if you already have your own flow cytometer, you can actually import the FCS file directly into Novo Express and use Nova Express as a third-party software. So you can download a free 30-day trial at the link that's listed right here. And you can find more information about the Novosite flow cytometer at acabile.com. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, does anyone have any questions?